Thank you very much, Dr. Stephen Gundry. This is a huge pleasure um, to have you as a returning guest on the show of the Talstoff blog in Germany. The last time uh, we spoke together, uh, we discussed your then recent book, The Plant Paradox, which has um, been a huge, huge success for you in, times, uh, in terms of um, uh, being 34 weeks, I think it was, on the New York Times bestseller list, amongst others. But it has yeah. also been a very popular uh, issue on, on this blog. So the Talstoff blog um, gets a lot of hits uh, concerning the plant paradox and, and lectins and, and all this, um, what we discussed. So thank you for agreeing um, to, to do a follow-up, um, which, of course, has to do with another book of yours has just been published in the US and that's the longevity paradox. We don't have it yet here in Germany. We're looking forward um, to, um, to having it in the German language as well. But uh, I'm, I'm very happy that you agreed to discuss um, the book and, and, and the, the main topics um, with me on the show. So, so thank you very much, Dr. Gandhi. Well, thanks for having me back. Uh, it will be uh, coming in German. I don't know the exact release date, but uh, stay tuned. It's coming. Yeah, and I will, of course, we will do uh, um, uh, information to all our readers and listeners about the exact time. But uh, anyhow, I think uh, your your books uh, they they are um, to be understood in a in a in, a, in terms of uh, consequential um, follow-up. So the first uh, book of yours was the, um, uh, sorry, the English was uh, the Andrew Evolution Diet or how, how? Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution. Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution. And then of course, uh, um, we had the Plant Paradox, which uh, had a, a title in German, which was a bit um, um, funny. Are, are unusual with evil um, vegetables. It was translated, but of course it was <laughs> it was a very very uh, important to have it um, uh, in German. And now it is the, the longevity paradox. And if you were to describe um, the the what is what is the the combining um, uh, theme you are uh, laying out in, in those three books. What is, what is uh, longevity leading up to? Well, the, the subtitle of the longevity paradox is how to die young at a ripe old age. Oh. And I think that's the paradox of uh, longevity. I think all of us uh, want to uh, not die uh, and get older. But at the same time, we, we look uh, uh, at citizens um, and we don't really like what we see. We see uh, people in, uh, in nursing homes. We see people getting hip and knee replacements. We see people uh, developing heart disease, developing cancer. And we see this you know, growing a monstrous epidemic of Alzheimer's disease, yes. uh, dementia, and Parkinson's. And that future doesn't look very good. So that doesn't case. And there's a lot of exciting research that others have done and that I have done that uh, in the book, I hope to give readers a roadmap on how to stay young have youthfulness uh, despite getting very old in years. Uh, and the other exciting thing is, uh, just like in the plant paradox, it, it's never too late to make these changes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's the basic message of the book. Right. Um, in, in, in my words, uh, the plant paradox was uh, centering very much around the issue of uh, autoimmune diseases uh, as a result of diet as well as environmental uh, factors. 
and the longevity paradox. Um, I, I have read it, uh, uh, and and that's concerned about um, the process of um, having a, a long, healthy life, which uh, is not on on the top list of the priority of of our genetic um, program. Is that a fair um, description? Yeah, I think that's a fair description. I think that where where the longevity paradox takes off from the plant paradox is I, I spent a lot of time in the plant paradox talking about the microbiome, the, the bugs that live in our gut, on us, around us. And, and this is an even deeper dive into the importance of the interaction between the microbiome and the wall of our gut and us in general. And the really exciting uh, thing is that uh, there was a paper published in Nature late last year that looked at the effects of human genes, in other words, family history, on outcome, on longevity. And they found that really our family history, our human genes have only about a 6% influence on what's going to happen to us. But the vast majority of the influence comes from environmental factors, from the food we eat, and the diversity and types of the microbiome, the, the bugs. And the really exciting thing is you can look at 105-year-old people around the world, healthy 105-year-old people, and they have the microbial diversity, they have the diverse bug population of healthy 30-year-olds. And so what uh, is that we can cultivate a set of bugs that will actually keep us, their, their home, uh, they live in us, um, very healthy for a very long time. And, and the book goes into, okay, here's the steps uh, to do that. Right. Um, your books have been very successful, but also uh, among some of your colleagues, very controversial. Uh, and if you allow, I, I would like to um, to discuss a little bit of this criticism. To me, as a yeah. reader who is um, uh, who is, of course, interested in in sound um, uh, findings and in, in sound advice, um, it was a very compelling story um, you tell in all of your books, which I have read. Um, but some of your colleagues, uh, they say, well, there is not much scientific evidence um, within humans um, that supports uh, your, um, your thesis. So when I read this, I thought, well, maybe this is true. I cannot really say because I'm not reading all those scientific papers. Uh, I have... Um, uh, I have watched, uh, uh, looked at the references in your book, and to me, this this uh, is um, it is very very clear that you point to to scientific literature there. Um, but it is clear that it is a very new and novel approach um, to understanding health and even uh, longevity. So therefore, um, is it really fair to expect? Uh, every tiny bit of um, evidence with relates uh, with relations to to humans. So human studies at a at a early time cannot be there um, in this way that critics say you should have um, portrayed it. Or how how do you handle those criticism? Well. Uh... You know, as as a as a bench researcher and as an epidemiologic researcher for for my career, uh, we depend uh, on animal studies to at least give us a foundation mm -hmm. to base uh, what we should do in humans. And I think there's no question in anybody's mind that animal studies are useful 
to tell us what's going to happen. But when I recently, one of my uh, critics uh, criticized my new book, as I'm sure he was going to do, and some of my opening papers was basing some of my recommendations on what happens in a worm, C. elegans. Now, and he said, you know, how can that apply to humans? Well, every, every, every finding in C. elegans, and C. elegans is a, is a model that's been used in longevity uh, forever, mm -hmm has been duplicated in higher animals, including uh, apes, including rhesus monkeys. And everything that's been found in C. elegans uh, has subsequently been proven in higher mammals. Mm -hmm. And so there's no question in anyone researching in longevity that C. elegans is actually maybe the perfect model there is because this little worm uh, lives really only a few weeks. And so you can do a manipulation and find out very quickly if that manipulation did something. Right. And, what's, and, and what's important about that is this worm and subsequently higher animals have shown us that we, our fate is tied up with the, with the boundary between the lining of our gut and this worm has a lining of its gut, and the bacteria that, that live in the gut. And there's a constant to and fro, uh, literally battle at that surface. And bacteria can actually enhance the uh, strength of that wall, or they can get through that wall. And Research has shown that as this wall gradually breaks down and deteriorates, that that's the cause of aging and the eventual demise of the worm. And we see now in subsequent studies that in fact, that exact same process, what happens between our microbiome and the wall of our gut, determines uh, inflammation, uh, what's called info-aging, uh, and strengthening that wall and having the right sort of bacteria that will actually increase the strength of that wall is where we need to put our efforts if we're going to have a long, healthy lifespan. So, you know, I didn't invent the model of C. elegans. It just happens to work perfectly. And Everything that's happened in that cute little worm has been duplicated in higher animals. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah plus, it's, um, uh, recently I interviewed um, Professor Bulmore from Cambridge University who is researching uh, on, on depression. And, and there was a similar uh, problem there that uh, many, for ethical reasons, many studies um, which would be needed to prove conclusively um, uh, with humans uh, that inflammation is a very, very important and maybe even causal uh, factor in, in depression. And there is a connection to the gut there as well and the brain, gut brain barrier, uh, a gut brain connection, uh, cannot be done for ethical reasons in humans uh, because it is not ethical to make someone inflamed who isn't inflamed. Um, uh, so therefore you have to rely on, on animal models. Right. Um, but, you know, the, I mean, the subsequent, you know, human investigations have really consistently uh, more and more shown that, that, for instance, that brain connection is not only real, mm -hmm. but it's actually far more extensive than, than any of us could have ever imagined. Now, you know, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, uh, 2,500 years ago, said that all disease begins in the gut. And you know, we're just now uh, getting the sci scientific tools yeah. to realize that he was right. And uh, so we have to, you know, we just have to trust uh, and use animal models as much as possible, but then look at successful human aging and say, 
okay, what is it about these, you know, super old humans uh, that we can find commonality with? What can we tell about their gut? What can we tell about the their behaviors, their activities, their uh, communities uh, to guide us? And that's what I try to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you have uh, mentioned um, the plant paradox and and the role of lectins um, as plant defense mechanisms in our last interview and lectins also play a role for uh, longevity um, because they can disturb and do disturb um, the microbiome um, very severely uh, however you are also um, um, saying that well lectin is something which all plants or virtually nearly all plants have and it is the uh, adjustment the cohabitation between us and certain plant uh, and, and, and and their lectins which is either um, um, beneficial to our health and that's um, the, the the food which we are evolved to, to live on or could be detrimental and that's quote uh, uh, so to speak novel food and novel meaning not uh, um, t recent developments in, 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 in food technicals but uh, 10,000 years being a period which is quite novel in terms of adjustment uh, of the microbiome uh, to our, our foodstuffs. Yeah, let me, let me give you an example um, which has recently been discovered. Um, these who eat a lot of seaweed actually are the are the only people that have been identified with a microbiome with bacteria that are capable of digesting the the lectins in seaweed mm -hmm. and they it's thought because the japanese at least as far as we can tell uh, have probably been eating seaweed weed for over a hundred thousand years by some estimates so and they've been eating a lot of seaweed and so they the the theory is that they uh, acquired bacteria that enjoyed eating seaweed uh, like i write about in the plant paradox we know there are bacteria that actually can eat gluten which is a lectin but the japanese are the only people yet deferred that have my, a microbiome that's capable of digesting the lectins in seaweed. So this is, you know, recent proof that in fact you have to acquire uh, a microbiome that's capable of eating a, a novel lectin-containing plant. And the paper I actually reference uh, was done actually by uh, my medical school, the Medical College of Georgia. Um, and what they found was that the lectins in seaweed can actually attack uh, the beta cell of the pancreas mm -hmm. and, and cause diabetes. So here's a, you know, here's a novel new finding that suggests that this novel food, seaweed, um, is a recent addition to your my diet <laughs> until until sushi was introduced to the west none of yeah. us would have ever would have ever eaten seaweed mm -hmm. and now we think nothing of it but we actually don't have the microbiome to eat it right and um and, and that is also an explanation or a similar uh, um, train of thought is an explanation for why certain um uh certain diets, uh, Mediterranean diets, um, are contributing to a long and healthy um, um, life, even though some of, their, of those components uh, might not be too beneficial for us, and, and, but are offset by other components which those, um, those cultures um, um, tend to um, ingest. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. And I, and I make that point, and I've made it in the past quite strongly. We, we look at the Mediterranean diet, and we look at, you know, people who live in the Mediterranean, and clearly uh, two of the blue zones are in the Mediterranean diet. 
And I think a, a third blue zone that I describe in the book, the, uh, the town of Acciaroli, south of Naples, Italy, should be a blue zone. Dan Buckner did not know about that town when he wrote the book. But these people um, clearly have great longevity. And we, we look at the factors that these people eat, and people say, well, you know, they eat lots of cereal grains and they, they eat lots of beans. But in fact, those, that number one, that statement is not true. For instance, the people in Acciaroli do not eat any grains. They have no breads. They have no pasta. They do eat lentils, which have been soaked in a traditional way, which mm -hmm. removes lectins. Uh, but these places eat huge amounts of olive oil. They drink quite a bit of wine, particularly red wine, and they eat small fishes, anchovies in, in Acheroli, and they eat uh, a lot of uh, vinegars, like balsamic vinegars. So mm -hmm. Stefan Lindeberg, in, in his, I think, classic book, he makes the point that cereal grains, for instance, are a negative factor in the Mediterranean diet that's compensated for by all the positive factors, like you know, a liter of olive oil per week in most of these countries. Mm -hmm. And we we miss that fact that you know there is a balance. And as I point out in the longevity paradox, the Italians actually have a very high incidence of arthritis, which I would predict is from their fairly high, you know, cereal grain intake and bean intake. And Sardinians, <clears throat> excuse me, who uh, are one of the blue zones, have the highest incidence of autoimmune disease in Europe. And they actually eat uh, up to 10 pieces of bread every day. And I've pointed out, and Stefan Lundeberg has pointed out, that this is probably the factor on why they have so much autoimmune disease. But yeah. my critics, um, oh well. Yeah, well, um, talking about Italy and, and the Mediterranean, and, and you've mentioned already olive oil, maybe it is, it is a good uh, example to, to discuss one or two um, uh, points which are uh, which you are stressing a lot and and that is maybe if i understood you correctly olive oil is very important not because of the form type of fat which it uh, consists uh, but because of the components which which come along uh, with olive oil um, and, and can you maybe elaborate a little bit on this what is yeah that that's a, yeah that's absolutely correct um, and in the past, I've, uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, talking and chatting with, uh, there's actually a minister in charge of olive oil in Italy. And uh, he points out correctly that there's, there's nothing unique about oleic acid, uh, which is the major component of olive oil and, and avocado oil for that matter. It's a monounsaturated fat and it's not particularly great or not particularly bad. But it's a carrier for compounds that are called polyphenols. And the polyphenols in olive oil uh, have really unique properties. Uh, there is a, a very well uh, out of Spain called the Predimed study, where Essentially, of people uh, 65 years of age, and they were divided into the um, initial study was to look at memory. And one group, uh, they all ate a Mediterranean diet. It was Spain, after all. Uh, the first group had to use a liter of olive oil per week. Now, they actually had to bring their empty container to the clinic and get it refilled once a week. That's a lot of olive oil. Uh, although, two of the blue zones use a liter of olive oil per week. The second group had to eat the equivalent amount of calories uh, of that olive oil in nuts, uh, particularly walnuts. The third group ate a low-fat Mediterranean diet, and they were compared. Um, 
the long and short of it is at the at the end of five years, the olive oil group and the nut group had improved memory. Now think about that for a minute. Um, most of us would assume that from 65 to 70, we will you know, lose a bit of memory. These people actually gain, improve their memory. The low fat group, as expected, actually lost memory. Um, so both the nuts and the olive oil improved memory. But what was really striking was the olive oil group. Uh, people who had heart disease in this study, they had a 30% reduction in new events, uh, new stents, new MIs, new bypass, new strokes, compared to the low-fat group. And in the women in the olive oil group, they had a 67% reduction in the incidence of breast cancer compared to the other groups. Uh, there are other studies that now show that the polyphenols in olive oil actually increase a BDNF, brain-derived nootropic factor. And so why wouldn't you um, use this as a vehicle to get these polyphenols in you? Mm -hmm. I think the other exciting thing that was discovered by the Cleveland Clinic recently, and I've written about this in The Plant Paradox, and I write about it again in The Longevity Paradox, our, the bacteria in our gut are capable of taking certain animal proteins, particularly choline and carnitine that are in meats and eggs, and convert it into a chemical called TMAO, which the Cleveland Clinic uh, has shown, I think, very well that this clearly damages the surface of blood vessels. It's a major risk factor for uh, developing coronary artery disease and blood vessel disease in general. To their credit, they said, well, wait a minute. The, in the Mediterranean diet, these people are eating fish, they're eating meats, they're eating chicken, yet the Mediterranean diet seems to be protective against you know, developing heart disease compared to other diets. What factor is it? Well, they found that uh, components, polyphenols in olive oil, balsamic vinegar, and red wine paralyzes the enzyme systems in these bacteria so that they can't make uh, TMAO out of choline and carnitine. And uh, that enzyme um, has, has been identified. It's 331-dimethylbutanol. Uh, I think that's right. So here's a component of the Mediterranean diet, three components, that stop or allow people in the Mediterranean who use these components to have their meat and eat it too. Yeah. And so, yeah, so... Now we're beginning to understand, you know, why the components of this uh, are so useful. The maybe the most important um, conclusion which I drew from your books um, uh, are or is, um, it's not so much important um, what you eat, but rather what you don't eat um, is is important and and and. Uh, Things which contribute um, to autoimmune disease uh, are, are, for example, lectins, but also other factors which you mention in, in, in your books. So um, that's that's for us to 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 avoid. One recent or uh, one one new um, aha moment I had from reading the longevity paradox was that you seem to indicate that even coronary um, artery disease is related or is, is uh, um, there is an association to a form of autoimmunity. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on, uh, on this. Yeah, I um, was, uh, for most of my career, a transplant heart surgeon, uh, both in infants and adults. And uh, early on in our experience with children and infant heart transplants, uh, we noticed that their arteries um, got diseased 
and looked very much like people who got uh, diabetic uh, heart disease, uh, coronary artery disease. And it was actually incredibly curious to me that why would this happen? Well, you realize that the, the, the wall of the blood vessel of the heart that you transplanted is, which is foreign, is in contact with the blood of the recipient. And so there's an interaction between our immune system, our white blood cells, and that foreign material. And so there is an attack going on. And when we see that disease, um, it made sense. What didn't make sense was, well, why would we see that exact same process in a diabetic patient? But uh, subsequent research, including some of mine, that in fact, this is a, a same sort of immune attack on our blood vessels. Uh, I've got a paper that I'm going to present at the vascular biology meeting of the American Heart Association next month in Boston that I think makes another strong case that certain lectins uh, in our diet promote an autoimmune attack that we can measure uh, in the blood vessels and that when we remove lectins from the diet, particularly grains and uh, nightshades, that we can actually see that autoimmune attack uh, regress. Um, so, I mean, for instance, there are three very well designed papers that show that the lectins in peanut oil cause coronary artery disease in three different species of monkeys, rhesus monkeys, red velvet monkeys. And when you remove that lectin from the peanut oil and give these animals peanut oil without the peanut lectin, they don't get coronary artery disease. Now, my critics say, well, but that's in a monkey. I mean, what are we gonna do? Do the human experiment where you know we, we make humans drink a gallon of peanut oil every day? I don't think so. I mean, we're, we share most of our genes with, you know, apes, and let's, you know, let's get over it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it is, it is fascinating. Uh, after we spoke last and we did the interview on the plant paradox, uh, I happened to meet uh, a young lady or, um, who was um, suffering from uh, juvenile polyarthritis for for many many years, and when she was advised by her doctor, who had read your book, um, to cut out lectins, um, all her inflammatory markers went uh, negative, uh, and she was she became symptom free, and and she gained a lot of a lot of uh, um, health and and quality of life. So. Um, that is what I find so fascinating uh, in your work is that you are um, drawing on a vast uh, amount of experience and scientific ex expertise, uh, but at the same time you're um, you're putting this in a language which a uh, layperson can understand and can easily choose to uh, to make use of uh, of your recommendations. Um, uh, Dr. Gandhi, you you ha, um, have uh, ongoing appointments, but one question I would like to ask is: there are other factors uh, for longevity which you also discuss in your book, um, uh, which go beyond uh, just what we eat or, or what uh, the environment is. For example, uh, working against gravity or, or, or some other aspects. Would you would you like to share some of those thoughts to our, our audience? Yeah, I think. Uh... Exercise uh, definitely has a major component in uh, healthy longevity. If one of the interesting things about the blue zones is that all of these communities are in hilly towns. In fact, Loma Linda, where I was a professor for most of my career, it, the the word in Spanish is beautiful hill, and uh, all of these communities communities are work up and down against gravity for most of their most of their lives. I mentioned in the book that my great grandmother who died uh, one month shy of her 100th birthday lived in a three-story house that she and her husband had actually built 
And their bedroom was on the third floor of the house. And uh, she, till the day she died, several times a day, uh, walked up and down three flights of stairs to her bedroom. And my sister and I, growing up, uh, we, were, we were a very close-knit family, couldn't understand why our great-grandmother wouldn't, you know, move her bedroom um, down to the first floor as she got older. Well, as it turns out, my great-grandmother was very wide. Uh, she, you know, that walking against gravity clearly kept her alive. She also had a small glass of red wine uh, right before bedtime. Um, so she was pretty smart in lots of ways. Um, this, the other well, thing is... Uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, we, we had a lapse of, um, of the ah. technical glitch. Yeah. Um, the other fascinating study that looks at women, uh, women get more Alzheimer's disease than mm. men, which surprises most people. Well, you know, we're, we're the weaker sex, but women, in fact, do get higher rates of Alzheimer's. Women who exercise routinely through their lives, and it doesn't have to be strenuous exercise. It can be gardening. It can be housework. It can be walking the dog twice a day. Those women uh, have a 90% reduction in developing Alzheimer's compared to women who don't routinely exercise. And even if they get Alzheimer's, the Alzheimer's occurs 11 years later than the women who don't exercise. Now, think about that. If we developed a drug that had a 90% effectiveness of Alzheimer's, we would all say, how much can we pay for this drug? It would be the big, biggest selling drug of all time, and yet we have that drug available to us. And think about if, you know, if I'm going to get Alzheimer's, instead of getting Alzheimer's at 80, I'd get Alzheimer's at 91, and I, I'd have, you know, over a decade of, you know, a great life. And, you know, if I got it at 91, well, you know, I, maybe I wouldn't remember it and it, it wouldn't be so bad. But when you look at the things that people can do in their 80s, uh, I'll take an extra 10 years. And all we got to do is, you know, develop an exercise routine that you'll do and you'll enjoy. And I have a small five minute routine that I give people in the book. So, right. uh, and particularly, you know, in Germany, uh, you have tremendous benefit of, of hills. And so whenever you can go hiking and uh, my wife and I hike throughout one of the things that's very consistent throughout our, our hikes, whether we're in France or we're in Italy, Portugal, is there are groups of Germans hiking. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so, so keep it up. <laughs> we, we will. The last question um, um, for, you, for you, please. Um, Time-restricted feeding, um, calorie restriction, and the concept of hormesis. What is, what is all about um, with this? Yeah, I think uh, the more and more we look at uh, the effects of intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding or uh, windows, uh, uh, the more we're seeing that this has incredibly positive effects on making our mitochondria, the energy generating organelles, be able to shift from using glucose as a fuel to using a form of ketones as a fuel. And this metabolic flexibility may be one of the real keys to healthy aging. We have to have the ability, almost like a hybrid car, to shift from battery power to uh, engine power. And most of us, because we live in 365 days of continuous food availability, and we live in a, in a time when we can eat constantly throughout the day, uh, we never get this opportunity to um, 
challenge our mitochondria to use other food sources. And it's this challenge that uh, that, you know, that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Uh, all great religions have some form of fasting. And I think the more all of us study this, we realize that these religions didn't do it as a you know, religious suffering period. It was actually because the Sir, we see they that. recognize to improve the health. I'm sorry, I, the, the last sentence got cut off from the poor line. I just, yeah, it, these, you know, these religious um, practices probably were involved with improving health of the practitioners rather than, you know, improving their devotion to the spirit that they worship. Yes. Dr. Gandhi, thank you very much. It has been um, a fascinating talk again. Uh, I could continue, um, but I mustn't because uh, you have got other obli obligations. We are looking forward very much to the publication of your book, The Longevity Paradox, in German anytime soon. And I can promise all our audience it is a fascinating um, read the stories you tell about, which we didn't discuss today, about the connection between the uh, mitochondria and our microbiome, uh, both being sort of bacteria. Bacteria. Yeah. It's fascinating. So uh, I highly, highly recommend um, um, the book um, to all of our um, audience. And I'm very much um, honored to uh, having had the pleasure to interviewing you again. Is there any last... Um, um, oh, it's been or, any idea sure. you would, would like to share? So, you know, I think that uh, people should realize that uh, their, their fate is, uh, is actually in, in their mouth and uh, in their legs. And so it's the food that you put in your mouth that feed friendly bacteria bacteria that's all the difference long term in, in our health fate and we all want a good health span and we want that health span to correlate with our lifespan wonderful that's a very nice closing thoughts thank you very much dr gandry uh, all the best to you and i look forward to reading your book in german all the best to all you. right thank you bye 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 bye